If you have a Bible, you can open it up to Psalm 130. You would not maybe think of this as a Christmas passage, but for years, uh, lots of years, this has been used in the Advent calendar. And what Psalm 130 points to is hope fulfilled. And this morning, what I want to do is give you kind of a, a, a brief synopsis of the doctrine of hope as found in the scriptures. In Romans 15, 4, Paul actually tells us that the scriptures were written to bring us or to give us hope. And so we want to look this morning at Psalm 130, which is a psalm written by David, and he talks about his like personal journey through hope, and I want to connect this personal journey through hope uh, to the collective or kind of the corporate world's journey for hope, and then tie it back in to the personal at the end. And so our text uh, this morning, Psalm 130, we're just going to kind of work our way through it uh, and see how David builds a foundation of hope in this text. He starts like this, out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. David is in a place of the depths. This was not an unfamiliar place, unfortunately, for David. He had a lot of time in the depths. It was 14 years from the time he was um, anointed king to the time he actually became king. And then even after David became king, he still had these, like, season in the depths. The depths are any place in life, whether you put yourself there or you just happen to be there or you're there because of what's going on in somebody else's life that you love. The place of the depths is the place of despair. It's the place where it seems like all hope has been lost, like there's no possibility for redemption, for restoration, for healing, for anything restorative to occur. In the depths, David finds himself. And in the depths of despair, in that place, David reminds us that even there, there's a place for hope. He says these words, hear my voice. It's as if David is praying, God, hear my prayers. He's praying, hear my prayers. Hear me in this place, O Lord. Now, all of us, at some point in time in life, will find ourselves in a similar place. If you're young and you've never been in the depths, just wait till you get older or wait till you have kids. You'll find yourself there. Emotional depths, physical depths, relational depths, these places where it seems like all is lost. And in those places, David reminds us on where our hope should turn to. God that our hope should turn to him, that even in those places, he hears us. Corporately, Israel and the world had been waiting for the incarnation of Christ. At the time of this writing, they'd actually been waiting for 3,000 years since the initial promise that a descendant of Adam would come who would restore all things. See, when sin entered into the world, it had a triune destruction, the first It destroyed man's relationship with God. It destroyed then man's relationship with each other. And then it destroyed man's relationship with the earth. So the subservient relationship between man and God, broken. The lateral relationship between humanity, broken. Man's stewardship role over the earth, broken. And then God made a promise of redemption. And the world waited for years and years and years and years. But God kept his word. And in the place of the depths, in the low moments of life, David wants to turn the the hope candle back on. We have it lit right over there. He said, don't let it go out even in the depths. And for the Christian this side of the cross, we know. We know that God is a God of the depths because God is familiar with the depths himself. Because Christ, who is God, came down from heaven 
to the depths of earth. And even while on earth, Jesus made himself lower to the place of a servant and then even lower to the place of a, being martyred. And then even lower, he faced the depths of the depravity of humanity when it all fell upon himself. And in that moment, Jesus was the only person in all of humanity who has faced the depths apart from the presence of God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, Jesus faced the lowest of the lows, the worst that this world can throw at anyone. Jesus faced it on the cross, but he faced it alone so that you and I could face it always in the presence of God. So even in the depths, there is reason for hope. But where we place that hope is important. And so in this next two verses, David tells us where to place it. He says, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. David is saying, if the fulfillment of our hope was on us, we'd be in big trouble. Who could stand? Nobody. We would always fall to the power of sin. It would destroy us as it already has destroyed so much. But David says, with you, there is forgiveness. What's happening here in verses three and four? Even a thousand years before the birth of Christ, David is understanding the power of the gospel. And David is teaching us here that all true hope must be rooted in the gospel that there is no real hope apart from the gospel. The the, the gospel, the, the story of Christ taking on the depravity of humanity on himself, but rising victoriously from the grave, that all hope centers around that. For it is the power to redeem all that was lost in the garden, the longing in your own soul, man's relationship with God, It is the power to redeem all relationships, to release bitterness and unforgiveness, to restore marriages and restore relationships uh, uh, amongst whomever. It is all through the gospel. Even creation itself, the world itself, will experience a full redemption through this gospel. That this gospel is the power to bring full redemption one day. See, Hope is predicated on the idea that a future desire will be met. The student hopes for the semester to come to an end. The pregnant woman hopes for the day of delivery. My sister's at home watching right now. She's three days over. We hope it's today. Michigan fans hope I didn't even finish the joke. Guess I don't have to. Hope is predicated on the idea that a future desire will be met. And in the gospel, one day, every true desire of the human heart will be met. These three remain faith, hope, and love. But love is the greatest. Why? Because one day, get this, hope won't exist anymore. Do you realize that? One day hope won't exist anymore. You know why? Because we won't need it. We won't need it because all of the true desires of humanity will have been met. So one day hope will disappear. We long for that day. So in the gospel, and only through the gospel, Can all things or anything be redeemed? And what hope, the purpose that it then serves uh, for each and every one of us uh, along the way is hope is like this currency or this energy pack uh, to move from like one season of life to the next. And sometimes those seasons are the depths and we ought not to lose hope in those moments. Sometimes those seasons are more normal. Uh, Sometimes those seasons are great. But in all of those, we have a hope that, that all we truly need, or we deeply need, will be one day found. All that is broken in the world around us will one day be fully 
redeemed. And so hope carries us from one moment to the next. I ran a marathon once. Some of you are laughing. I don't recommend it. A friend talked me into it. We are no longer friends. This was like 15 years ago. I ran the Detroit Marathon. I got to mile 20, and I was broken, (laughs) dead. I mean, not much energy to carry on. But at mile 20, at least on that particular year at the Detroit Marathon, there was a redemption station. And by that, I mean there was these people passing out these little gel packs of protein or probably just straight sugar. I don't really know what it was, but I ate one. And it got me from mile 20 to mile 21. And I thought, that was helpful. And then there was more at mile 21. So I ate another one. And that got got me to mile 21.5. My head, I was already doing math. I was like, this is diminishing very quickly. (laughs) How many am I going to need? So I tried 12. (laughs) What I didn't know was the side effects there is a Wendy's bathroom that will never be the same. (laughs) But I finished the marathon, mostly due to those energy packs. They were the currency that I needed to go from mile marker to mile marker. David, in the next verse, tells us the currency that we need to make it from one season of life to the next. Hope is the currency, but the the facilitator of it, the, the, the mechanism of it is what? It says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word, in his word, I hope. The word of God. Later, or earlier, actually, David would write the the irrevocable promises of God that have been refined through the fire but will always stay true. The Lord's promises are pure, he says. The word of God is how this hope is dispensed to us. It's the thing that gets us from marker to marker. So every Sunday we gather and what do we do? We preach out of the word of God so that your hope meter is refilled and you can keep going. And when you're in the depths, I would say all of life, but especially when you're in the depths, you're going to need more than just Sunday morning. I would say all of life because we see what the enemy wants to do and what life wants to do is it wants to strip all hope away from you. And the way that the enemy or the world itself will strip that hope away from you is by getting you to disbelieve the word of God. And then to take your mind off of its promises and to place your mind on the word of the world. Leading to a place of hopelessness and despair. And David says, no, no, I hope in one place, the word of God, I go back to it. And that fills and you can keep going to the next mile marker. Now, in the middle of these moments when we're uh, moving from one season to the next or when there's, a, when there's an unmet desire out in front of us, we just have to wait. And we're waiting. And David says that's where he was at in this moment. He says, I was in the place of the, of the depths. I was in a moment of despair. And there was, a, there was a hope that I would be like freed from it. And we know that in David's life, like there are these moments of despair and that God would free him out of it and, and he would walk in these good seasons and then he would go back in and, and I'm not so unfamiliar with our lives. And so in these places of the, of the depths in the waiting, what do we do? What do we do? I think we're to wait hopefully. What does it mean to wait hopefully? First, to continue to anchor our hope in the word of God. But then David helps us understand it a little bit better. He, he says, I long, or my soul waits for that redemption moment. Uh, my, my soul waits for, for, for that hope fulfilled. It waits like the watchman for the morning, like the watchman for the morning. It gives us a tangible idea of, of what it looks like to hope or to wait well. And there's three things that are true of the watchman waiting for the morning. The first is this. The watchman can do nothing to quicken morning's arrival. 
The watchman can do nothing to quicken morning's arrival, but the watchman can remain faithful in his task during the night. So what is waiting well? What is hopeful waiting? It is remaining faithful to walking with Jesus in between the moments of despair or depths and hope fulfilled. The second thing that is true for the the watchmen as they uh, wait for the morning, why is the watchman so excited about the morning? Two things. It means that the city is still safe and it means he can go to bed. There's rest. There's rest. The, the watchman anticipates the morning as we anticipate the moment uh, when, when that unmet desire uh, is achieved, when that redemption experience happens, we anticipate it because we know it'll bring some type of rest to our souls. Thirdly, what does the watchman know? Morning will happen. Morning always arrives. Every day, all of time, morning will happen. And so how do we wait well? Hopefully, we wait hopefully by anchoring ourselves in the word, by continuing to remain faithful in the season of waiting, and knowing confidently it will come at the right time. But when will it come? When will the redemption happen? When will that thing that you've been praying for occur? I could go through a a long list of, uh, of, of what these things are, right? Well, David then shifts to this more like pastoral moment. He says, oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord, there is steadfast love and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Now, remember, David is writing 3,000 years after the initial promise made in the garden. He's writing 1,000 years or so after Abraham and the promise made to him. I mean, time has passed by, but David is writing, it will happen. This, this incarnation, this, this redemption, it will happen. But how does it happen? Well, let's look at the universal story. You see, the world itself, collectively, all of us and all of humanity and and, and even the earth itself have longed for three different things. We've longed for the incarnation. We've longed for the resurrection. And now we long for full redemption or his great return someday. The world has longed collectively for these three things And as we look at these three things that the world has longed for, what it teaches us is God's process of hope fulfilled. And the process that applies to the collective is also the process that applies to the individual or the personal for you. And how has God brought hope fulfilled? Four truths in all three of these, the incarnation, the resurrection, and the second coming. Four truths that I think are also true in your own life as you await redemption. First, the timing is never what you would think. It is never what you would think. As I previously said, 4,000 years from Adam to Christ. 2,000 years from Adam to Abraham. I mean, Adam and Eve lived a few hundred years after this promise and they saw no progress toward it. And then Abraham gets the promise and 2,000 years again passes. That's why the prophets would, would cry out, don't lose hope, don't lose hope, don't lose hope. It will happen. It's why David writes, he will redeem. He will bring the redemption. But the timing was never what they would have thought. In the second example, the resurrection. It seems like all of Israel in the 48 hours between the cross and the resurrection sunk into a despair equal to the previous 4,000 years. 
It took 4,000 years to get them to the level of despair from the initial promise, and then they felt it in a moment in his death. And Jesus is resurrected, and he's walking on a road, and the two people that he's walking with, they, they don't recognize him. And he's having this conversation with them. And he says, why are you guys so sad? I'm paraphrasing. Why are you so sad? And they said, oh, don't you know? We had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped. Who? All of us. We had thought that, that what we had been waiting for, the desire, would finally have been met. And their timing was off again because hope was standing right in front of them. And the third one, the third example, I barely even need to explain this one, but we're awaiting the second coming of Christ, of course, and people, you know, ask me sometimes, do you think the world's ending? Do you think the world's ending? Do you think the world's ending? Like, what's going on here? And I'll say this, people have been asking that question for 2,000 years, and all of them have been wrong, and I don't want to join that list. So I'm not going to answer your question. His timing always is different than we expect. And friends, in your life, as you await, his timing will always be different than you expect. Secondly, the plan is never the plan that we would come up with. Imagine when God had said to Adam and Eve, through your son, we'll redeem all things. Oh, but in a couple of years, I'm going to send a flood and I'm going to start all over. Didn't tell them, that's Adam and Eve. Then to Abraham, through your seed, the whole earth will be blessed. But they're going to have to spend some time in captivity. And then they're going to go into the promised land. There's going to be giants. They're going to be really afraid. And then they're going to build a new nation. And then there's going to be a king. But then some of those kings are going to be bad. And then the kingdom is going to split into two. And then you're going to go into captivity. And then you're going to come back. And then you're going to go into captivity again. Then there's going to be a really long, empty space. Like, who would have come up with that plan? And then even the cross. Jesus, his closest followers, he tried to tell them, no, this is the plan, this is the plan, this is the plan. And they just kept saying to themselves, this can't be the plan, this can't be the plan, this can't be the plan. Paul would echo it later, and he would say, the whole world just thinks this plan was foolish. And Jesus would say, and God would say, and that's exactly my plan. So corporately and personally, friend, for that redemption, the thing you are hoping, the plan will never quite be the plan you would play out. The third thing that is true universally here throughout all of these is the people God uses are never the people we would pick. I mean, in the first one, Baron Sarah, you're going to have the child. Shortly thereafter, he uses a raped and disgraced Tamar. Then a Gentile prostitute named Rahab who just happened to have the right piece of real estate. Her widowed granddaughter, Ruth. David, the adulterer. Solomon, the womanizer. Like who would come up with this list to bring forth such great redemption? The people Jesus picked to be on his team, not the team that the world was telling him to pick. How God ushers in this second coming would probably not be the people we would pick. And oftentimes in your life, when God brings forth redemption, you might think, this is the person who's going to help me. This is the person who will do this. This is the person that's going to break this through or all of this. And I'm telling you, God will use people you'd never expect. plan, the people, the timing will always be different. This is how God goes about fulfilling hope. But here's the fourth thing that I think is universally true, that when he fulfills the hope, it is always better than anything we could have expected. Isaiah chapter 9. Give me a second as I flip there. We read it earlier. 
Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 2. But there will be no gloom for, who, for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Natali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. Out of the depths, light breaks in. See, with the incarnation, with the resurrection, and I would imagine with his second coming, and I would, and I know in your own life, that when that redemption comes, when that, when that hope is fulfilled, better than we could ever hope, better than we could imagine. Luke chapter 2 tells the story of a man who was waiting His name is Simeon. It says, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation or the redemption of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, oh, can we pause for a minute? As we hear the whimpering of a child right now, it's probably mine. Simeon, held in his arms what 4,000 years of hope fulfilled. He looks down at the child and he says, Lord, now, right now, finally, the timing was nothing as we had expected. We've been waiting and longing, but now you are letting your servant depart in peace. According to what? According to your word, because all hope has to be rooted in the word of God. For my eyes have seen your salvation. This is all coming through the gospel because it is the only place where real hope can lay that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles. The Israelites had gotten a little narrow in their focus, a longing the Christ who would come and bring redemption. But Simeon is reminding them this is even bigger and better and greater than anything we could have longed for. It's not just the redemption of us, God's chosen people. It's the redemption of everyone or for everyone of everything. It's bigger than even us. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Hope fulfilled. And both the incarnation and the resurrection remind us that God kept his word, that hope will be fulfilled My friend, the plan, the timing, the people may be way different than anything that you could anticipate, but the outcome will be better than you could ever create on your own. You know, Proverbs 10 tells us that hope produces joy. Hope fulfilled produces joy. I saw this firsthand (laughs) this week. Um, Lindsay, by the way, wherever you are, you can come up. I saw this firsthand this week. Um, Lindsay and I have been practicing our parenting and trying to get better. (laughs) And uh, we've realized that we had gotten Reagan in the habit of waking up every morning or waking us up every morning by tapping me and going, watch it, Joe. Watch a cho is three-year-old speak for, I'd like you to turn on the television and get out of bed, old man. And so 
that's what we would do. And she'd go down and she'd watch a show and all of that. And we got into, made a parental decision that this little heathen child doesn't get to watch TV until seven o'clock, right? Like, you know, she wakes up at 6.15 and brought her downstairs. And she said, turn on the TV, daddy, turn on the TV, daddy. And I said, oh, just look at the clock. And I said, once it says seven, you can watch TV. And um, she looked at it and she knows her numbers, but she doesn't know how to tell time. She's three. Stop judging me. Okay. And she looked and it's all six and the like light of her face just completely disappeared. She instantaneously went into any depths that David had ever known. And I looked at her sad face and there was something in me that wanted to just go turn on the TV. But I didn't. Why? Because I know seven is coming. Like, I know when it's coming. And so I didn't. And she pulled up a chair <laughs> to the clock and just sat on the chair. And she didn't even know how to tell time. And I'm like, you're going to stand there for 45 minutes? I said, you should just go play. Like, you should just wait well. Go play. Seven will come. She just sat there, so I left. I went, and I started doing what I do every morning and working my way through my morning routine. I don't know for whatever reason, but at 6.55, she walked back in, and she sat on my lap. She said, Dad, is it ever going to be seven? I said, yeah, it will. Yeah, it will. I said, why don't you sit with me and pray for a little bit? And so I knew it was 6.55, so I started a five-minute timer, and I started praying. And when we got done, I said, why don't you go look? She walked into the kitchen, and she shrieks runs back in and goes, Daddy, it's seven. It's seven. It's seven. Should we wake up, Mommy? Should we turn on the TV? It's seven. I said, well, don't wake up, Mom, because then this won't be a joyous moment anymore. But let's go watch a show. And I turn on the TV, and all of the depths of despair were gone. Friend, God knows when it needs to be seven in your life. And at the right time, it will turn seven. And in the meantime, crawl up on your father's lap. Talk with him in the meantime. And when seven hits, experience the full joy of hope fulfilled. He will not let you down. Anchor your hope in his word because Christmas teaches us he always keeps his word. Let's pray. Father, I pray for my friends this morning that they would hold on to hope whether they're in the depths right now or someone they love is. I pray that we would wait well and I pray that in the moments it turns seven that we would have incredible joy and hope fulfilled. And we thank you that you are a father that knows exactly when seven needs to hit in our lives. And so may we never lose hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you'd like to take a next step with Redemption Church, visit us online at experienceredemption.com slash connect card. 
You can also give online to support the work of Redemption Church. To explore your giving options, visit experienceredemption.com slash give online. We hope that the message you heard today encouraged you. See you again soon.